Welcome to the Designing Hollywood Podcast. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. The Designing Hollywood Podcast is dedicated to all things movies, the movie industry, and its talented professionals. Today's episode is sponsored by the Western Costume Company. Today's very special guest is an award-winning concept artist and artistic director for film, music video, and television for the past 15 years. He is also CEO and co-founder of the 9B Collective, the first black-owned concept artist studio made up primarily of BIPOC artists. His client list includes the likes of Warner Brothers, Sony, Marvel Studios, Netflix, Fox, Disney, DreamWorks, and many more. His work spans a multitude of blockbuster hits, including the J.J. Abrams Star Trek films, Terminator Salvation and Terminator Genesis, X-Men Origins Wolverine, Inception, The Social Network, Super 8, Captain America, The First Avenger, The Twilight Saga, Breaking Dawn, Mission Impossible, Ghost Protocol, Beautiful Creatures, Man of Steel, The Madonna MDNA Tour, come on now, X-Men, Days of Future Past, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Tomorrowland, Westworld, Ghost in the Shell, Power Rangers, The Fate of the Furious, Guardians of the Galaxy, Kingsman, The Golden Circle, Black Panther, an upcoming Wakanda Forever, A Wrinkle in Time, The Girl in the Spider's Web, The Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, The Midnight Sky, Godzilla vs. Kong, The Jupiter's Legacy TV series, all the way up to the Jungle Cruise. And he's working on the upcoming feature, Blue Beetle. He also has production designed several music videos for artists such as Ariana Grande, The Black Keys, Panic at the Disco, Tiesto featuring Busta Rhymes, to name but a few. A highlight of his work in the music industry is having completed three world tours, illustrating costumes for Madonna under the direction of Ariane Phillips. He enjoys dedicating his time to uplifting young artists and giving back to his community. He's a frequent panelist at the San Diego Comic-Con and often does talks at universities like UCLA, USC, FITM, Cal State Long Beach, Otis, and he travels once a year to Grand Rapids, Michigan to participate in the Mosaic Film Experience, which caters toward providing education about careers in the entertainment industry to African-American and Latino youths. He also partners frequently with nonprofit organizations like the Brick Foundation and has been an executive board member of the Costume Designers Guild for the past nine years. Costume designers and studios are all very eager to work with him. Without further ado, please welcome the charismatic, loved and respected by everyone who knows him, award winning concept artist Philip Boutet Jr. to the Designing Hollywood Show. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. And I'm also humbled by hearing all those credits back. I think. <laughs> I mean, I've said it before on this show. I feel like I feel like I'm like Wayne and Garth and I'm not worthy to talk to you. <laughs> no, no. I think it's um, especially when you're experiencing it, I think it really is. It just kind of it's time and it goes by. And I enjoy each project, but I also forget. So that thank you for that. That was really nice to just hear them back. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'm looking at this thinking my god now i've got to i've got to ask you did you grow up were you an imagination connoisseur as a kid were you reading comics were you collecting action figures were you watching comic book film science fiction movies horror movies tell us about tell us about your youth sir uh so first off i will say yes to all of those and i'm definitely not the hollywood person that's like i used to read comics like i actually read them um but i think it's one of those things that for me my start came from i actually was in the industry at a very early age i started acting at three years old wow. um so i was acting and i was an actor from three till about 17 or so um, and in that time, I did a lot of things. I did like television shows and commercials and, you know, all of that stuff. Um, one of the key ones that everyone laughs about is I was on Lamb Chops Play Along for about six years, I think, or something. Wow. Like um, and Family Ties, Highway to Heaven. I did a lot of 80 shows and commercials and stuff. So that was kind of my formative years was like in the industry, acting, you know, growing, learning, all of those things. Um, but one of the things that I always did in my trailer, because my parents were very protective and making sure that, you know, I didn't get messed up by the industry, um, was I would sit and I would draw. So I would do my homework. And then my dad was a computer engineer at the time at Unical in downtown, the Unical building that's now, I think, a studio, a film studio. Um, 
but he used to bring me the little, it was like the old school printers that had all the dots on the side. Right, and the it, dot matrix printers. The dot matrix ones, the little dot ones. So he'd bring me a box of that and I would sit and I would just draw and flip through it and draw and flip through and create characters and superheroes and costumes and all that stuff. And I just would really enjoy that almost like as a hobby. It would be my secondary thing that I would do when I was bored. So when I decided that I didn't wanna act anymore, I kind of wanted to go behind the scenes to tell stories. Um, because my frustration with the industry when I was a teen was pretty high in terms of mm. I would get an audition. It was right at the point, you know, I'm driving now so I can drive to my own auditions as opposed to my mom or my dad taking me. And I have all these relationships with producers and directors and stuff. So I'm like really starting to be like, okay, this is going to be the thing I'm going to do. And uh, every audition that I had, felt the same, meaning that it'd be like, okay, your character's name is Jamal, he's an inner city youth kid, and he's got no parents, and he's a gang member, and he's doing drugs, and he's doing all kinds of anything, he, you know, gets shot, and whatever, and I'm like, okay, great, so I like, I was like, okay, I can do that, I'll play that, and then the next audition would be the same thing, oh, you're gonna try out, you're gonna go for ER, but you're a gang member, and you get run over by a truck, and then you get shot, and then everybody comes and helps you turn your life around, it was the same story every single time, so the frustration for me was, I was like, where's the representation, I was like, get it, it's acting, right, so that's completely far away from who I am as a person, which is great, it's a challenge, but I started to see, I was saying, where are the roles for me? Meaning where are the roles for the, the guy that's like me? Has both parents, upper middle class, you know, like going to school, going to college, like where's that guy? And I never saw that guy reflected back in the roles that I was auditioning for. So I got really frustrated and I went to college and I said, you know what, I'm gonna combine my love of art and film and see if I can be eventually telling stories in that way and providing diversity and, you know, inclusion and stuff like that. So, you know, one of the things, obviously, and as we've done these shows, uh, a formal education and learning the basics, learning about art, learning about uh, design, uh, how how fabrics work, seems to be a recurring theme. And, and it becomes obviously an, a, an important factor in going into the design areas of film and television. So when you went to school, what was it that you were focusing in on? Uh, my, in terms focus, of my focus was character. I love character. I think because I was an actor, I love characters, right? So my focus was people, character. Um, and so I, I made my, my actual curriculum. I graduated from Cal State Long Beach, Go Beach. Um, <laughs> I graduated with a degree uh, major in uh, uh, film. Uh, sorry, a major in illustration and a minor in film. So I kind of combined those two things together. So it was during college that I started production designing because that was the first thing that people started to say like, oh, you want to do film when you draw? Like maybe you should be a production designer. I'm like, what's that? And so I started doing that. I mean, I knew what it was, but I had never done it. So I was like, what is that? Like, how am I going to do that? So that's where that career path started. And that led me down the path of being an art director and all of those things that I was ended up doing right when I graduated. Right. Now I'm curious because, you know, what you started out, um, you you worked on even before uh movies and things you were you were a, a production designer on on pr some pretty big music videos i mean you were working with people like the black keys and ariana grande and panic at the disco and tiesto mm -hmm. uh, with buster rhymes <laughs> uh and uh saint motel and the uk band the blackout mm -hmm. how did you find yourself designing for music videos so what I ended up doing, it's a fun story. Um, I, I, someone told me, I wish I, I wish I remember who it was, but someone told me while I was in college, they said, you know, Phil, when you graduate from college, it's going to take, usually it's a good three, three to five years of doing your career before you're not calling people and they're calling you. So me being the smartest that I am, I'm like, well, I'm going to be here in college for a while. So maybe I can get those three years out of the way now, <laughs> as opposed to waiting until I graduate and being like, what am I going to do? So I basically started to make my contacts and build relationships. I started doing like indie films and like stuff like that. But I made sure every semester that I had off, so every break. I would go and I would film something or be a part of something or go, you know, do some project in my, my break period. Like I wanted to be involved in film. So I did that for a while. Um, and I actually ended up prop mastering, um, a feature, um, uh, or a short, a short musical, 
um, called West Bank Story. Um, and it was really fun. <laughs> so it was a fun story. And it actually won an Oscar, that that one. Wow. Um, and it, like, it was actually won an Oscar for best, like, short, like, like music, musical, best short film. Well, that's pretty cool right out of the gate. Yeah, like, right out of the gate. And I just, like, prop mastered it. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. Um, and then I, like, that kind of gave me the bug. And so then um, on, a, on, a, on a randomness, I started doing music videos um, with a company, my friend Luga, Luga Podesta. Luga started a company called London Alley, which is now like one of, if not the biggest music video company ever. Um, and he reached out to me. I had done a video with my friend Danielle Clemenza. She's a production designer as well, as well for Panic at the Disco, uh, directed by Shane Drake. Um, and so Luga was graduating from Loyola Marymount and he, for his senior thesis, he was like, I'm going to do a music video. So he just typed in art director panic at the disco and he found my name. So he called me <laughs> like just randomly. And wow. so <laughs> we did his thesis, we did a music video. And then from there, he just started doing more and more. And we just kept growing and growing and growing. And, and then the company just kind of gone. So by the time I had graduated, I had already had those contacts and I was already working. Um, and I had been doing, you know, commercials and music videos and stuff. And so the music videos kind of took off and grew. Um, and in that interim, it's always hard to explain this part because there's like a point where I graduated, got out of college. I had also been introduced through my teacher at Long Beach, Robin Richardson, to the Costume Designers Guild. So she had kind of told us about it because she was in it, but it's something I didn't really pay attention to. I just knew she worked in film. She was a storyboard artist, so she was a part of the Art Directors Guild and mm -hmm. she did costume illustration. So she's a dual, a dual guild member. So it was just kind of fun watching her and learning from her and all of those things. And she was great, like a mentor. She taught me a lot about like figure drawing and costume figure and all of that, but didn't know that was gonna be my career because I was already production designing. So when we graduated in uh, spring of 2006, we went to Comic-Con, to San Diego Comic-Con. I was you, there. Right, yeah, so, right. So we went to Comic-Con and we're fresh out of college, just graduated and we graduated in June, Comic-Con's in July. So it was a month later and we're like, let's go, you know, we gotta go show our portfolios. So we're like looking at like Wizards of the Coast and Blizzard and all those sure. things that you would do, right? Uh, trying to find out like what we're gonna actually, um, like do for our, a living, like, like, let's see if we can get some illustration jobs. Now, meanwhile, granted, I'm still production designing. So this is like, for me, I'm thinking, this is just another avenue where I can use my art in a way. Mm. And Oksana, my friend that I was there with, um, who was also an illustrator and now a costume illustrator, she saw a panel for costume design, like for with costume designers. So it was like Juliana Makovsky, who did Harry Potter and Isis Musenden, who did Narnia. Like there was a, a, a panel of, you know, costume designers so we went we like you know and we like she dragged she's like isn't that what robin's a part of and we're like oh and so she's like we should go to this but you know me being the nerd that i am i'm like but like we gotta go to hall h like there's like so much stuff to do and she's like let's go to this costume panel we're like okay fine so we go and it was interesting and they showed their work and they showed illustrations and we're like hey those are costume illustrations that's what our teacher does so they had an autograph panel after like they do we went to it and we walked down the line and we just showed our portfolios thinking nothing of it wow a week later literally the week after comic-con um Eastby, um who did narnia she called oksana because oksana is a brilliant watercolor painter and has a very fantasy based style she said hey you know like I really liked your portfolio when you guys came through. How would you like to go to Prague with me for eight months to do Narnia too? And we're like, what? Like, so she calls us and she's all excited, you know, and she spent maybe a month here drawing and then she went, she literally went to Prague. So straight out of school, she's just gone. I'm still music videoing, you know, doing my work and doing that stuff. But then towards the end of that year, I said, you know what? This has been a real job for Oksana. So I should try it. Like, I should just try it as an avenue. So I joined the guild. And immediately after that, the month after I joined, I got a call from Sonia Hayes. Um, and she hired me to do The Mummy, The Mummy 3, Tomb of the Dragon with Jet Li. So and that, that was, was your first movie that you worked on? As a, as a, yeah, that was my first movie as a, as a concept artist or a costume illustrator. So yep. that was when I first started and I worked with her for six months. It was great. I mean, Sonya's gone on to do, you know, Captain Marvel. She also did the latest Spider-Man that just came out, um, which everybody loves. Um, so she, she was really a mentor to me and a guidance. And that's how my career started. Well, I have to ask you, you know, your career started in 2008 with, with Mummy. 
Mm-hmm. And if you look at the next two years of your career as a costume illustrator, mm-hmm. you went from The Mummy to Star Trek 09 to X-Men Origins Wolverine to Terminator Salvation to the Madonna Sticky and Sweet Tour to Jonah Hex to Inception to The Social Network. <laughs> All of the movies that you worked on were, I mean, these are not small films. These are huge gigantic comic-con friendly Mm -hmm. gig i mean they're they're uh, franchise ips and you didn't you didn't have a period of time where you toiled away in the indie film world you were in it man. (laughs) you were in it (laughs) that was the other thing it was weird because i was switching back and forth so i would do a costume illustration job then i productionized something so i was really going back and forth the whole time i think some parts of it i noticed i thought it was cool but i kind of it just really went by quickly (laughs) right yeah when you found yourself i mean you pretty and i think steven spielberg went to long beach if memory serves yeah so you have there's a there's a good pedigree there of a college (laughs) to go to but was it take us back and tell us what's it like working as a costume illustrator underneath a costume designer? Tell, take us through the work. How does how does that relationship that you have with a costume designer work? And where do you begin? It's it's a very um, uh, collaborative process. I feel like it's almost like it's like mind melding, or like it literally feels like like a. a like a venom type situation where it's like (laughs) we are design you know it's that type of deal um it's been really great because i've had a lot of i've worked for some of the best in the world costume designers um and i feel lucky to say that um they've become very good friends and colleagues of mine um Mm -hmm. i had a lot of mentorship and a lot of learning um but that process is very collaborative in the sense that as, as a costume illustrator or even a concept artist working in costume, it's our job to support the designer and their vision, right? So you're trying to figure it out. For me, I feel like it's almost like being a psychologist. I have to pull out parts that they want. I have to think about what their aesthetic is, what they like, you know, the things they gravitate towards, the things that they don't like, and then also trying to serve the story, right? The plot points of the story. And then on top of that, knowing that my illustration is going to go and it's the thing that sells the idea. So that sells to the director to the producer to the studio that that's what's being shown that's the big selling point right so you kind of have to get it right i had a a nice curve in there where after the mummy i went to a place called western costume where we were working at western of course and with eddie marks and so one of those things that ended up happening is western really fostered my career in the sense that it was booming at the time i was a new illustrator in the guild i was one of the first people in the guild to use computer you know like in my illustration as opposed Mm -hmm. to drawing traditionally Mm -hmm. so we were able to scan in fabrics and stuff like that so that was a big plus um, and a big help um, but also I was really eager to learn. And I also, i tell students all the time to be a self-starter. I don't sit idle ever. If you give me something to do, I'll complete the task as efficiently and as fast as I can. And then I will do more tasks before you come back. I never just sit and be like, what else you got? I'm going to always find something to do. So for me, when I was at Western, I networked. I started going down the line. I would show up. I would show people my portfolio. Sometimes designers would introduce me to other designers like Louise Mingenbach. I worked with her on Wolverine for maybe a couple of weeks. But the she job- designed all the original X-Men costumes for all X-Men 1. Correct. So she she was just incredible. And like really at the time, I remember something happened to where the job couldn't be as long as she wanted. And so she was like, you know what? I know that we were going to do this longer, but I have to kind of focus on this. So she took me upstairs to meet Michael Wilkinson. And then that's how I did Jonah Hex or sorry, or might have been no Terminator. It was Terminator. Um Terminator was at the point and um and then salvation. That, it was Terminator uh, Salvation. Terminator Salvation. So I got introduced to Michael Wilkinson and Ann Foley, who's now a designer who did Shield. So that was my first job. Ann was assisting Michael at the time. So I met both of them. And I really for that whole year just jumped around Western, meeting people and working on shows. Then Star Trek, I finished with Michael Kaplan at the end of the year. And that was because I forgot the caveat to this. It was me, Oksana, and Brian Valenzuela. The three of us went to Comic-Con together. So Brian ended up seeing Oksana join and then me join. And so he joined and then he got Star Trek as his first job. And when they needed another illustrator, I finished the year doing the job with him and Michael. 
So that was just the perfect caveat, but it was because I was willing to go and go door to door and to show my work and to like talk to people. Now I have to ask you, you know, you were jumping in from an illustration standpoint, working on X-Men origins, Terminator, Star Trek, and even Jonah Hex. These were all projects that had previous iterations or they had comic book uh, illustrations how much do you go back? Like, obviously, Star Trek had a a long lineage of costume design, an in-universe aesthetic that goes all the way back to the original pilot from 65, which was, of course, the cage, and then where Nomad has gone before, and then you jump all the way forward to 2009 and, and for that Star Trek. How, how much of that influence do you go back and look, or even the Terminator, movies we've seen glimpses of the future war and obviously terminator salvation took place in that apocalyptic future where we meet john connor you know and how how much research do you do and when you're working on a on an existing ip obviously you're you're not just you're a fan as well as an illustrator so you must have a sort of a geek do you, do you feel a a certain uh you have to go back and respect what's come before Oh, definitely. So I'm always, especially for nerd stuff, I'm the nerd in the room that like can't, um, I never compromise if I feel like it's wrong. So I'm definitely the person that says, no, you can't do that. No, they would wear <laughs> that. No, no, no. And I, and granted, like to a degree, especially earlier in my career, you don't really have much power. So you can say those things, but the powers are going to do what they do. So like, it's also crappy because as a nerd, and being the person that draws, you get blamed for it. So people are like, why? I saw you worked on this movie. Why did you take away Deadpool's mouth? I was like, I didn't even work on that character. It wasn't me, you know, but, <laughs> right. but granted, it still is one of those things that I am very much so for myself, very conscious of that. And a lot of the designers are too, like they work to try to make sure, but we always start with the character, the research, the comic books themselves or whatever the source material is, but I'm very staunch on honoring source material or at least bare minimum. I feel like our goal is to try, if you've been looking at a character and it's flat on the page, we wanna make it three-dimensional and cool, but like, like you could have never imagined. So it should look and feel like the character that you love, but like in a way that you feel like you're like, wow, I would have never imagined that, that's so cool. You know, so that's kind of how that works. Um, a lot of the times it's research, um, character design. I mean, character design is costume design. So it's really trying to get to the root of who that character is and then trying to, you know, flesh out something that, you know, supports the story. We, one of the things, okay, you, you worked on your first Marvel film was Captain America. I mean, pardon me, your first MCU movie, because <laughs> X-Men are obviously Marvel films too, but... Captain America, the first Avenger, you were the key costume illustrator on that film. That was back in 2011. I maintain that one of the great, um, there's so many things about the MCU that I love as a lifelong comic book fan and collector, but I love the costume design. I think from the get, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you know, Kevin Feige's team, Victoria Alonso, Louis Esposito, whatever, they, they really have a handle on how to translate characters from the comic book page to the screen and while it doesn't have it, obviously one medium is very different than another so you have to make you know you can't put wolverine in yellow and black spandex on 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 screen and captain america did i thought a just an absolutely brilliant job um with everything from the red skull to what hydra was looking like to the howling commandos or whatever the the, the soldiers but what I really love was the looks of Captain America as well. And when you see you've got the USO tour Captain America suit that's redolent of the, the classic comics, but then you have his halfway suit where he's half military and half Captain America. And then you finally get into that full on Captain America suit. But it was it was it was absolutely Captain America, but it also looked functional like this is what you could wear during World War Two. Now, for the Marvel movies, they have a huge uh, visual design department that's working before anybody's working on the movies. They, they're creating action sequences and images. And so I ask you, how much leeway in an MCU movie do you get? This is a really roundabout way to get to the question. Mm -hmm. But how much leeway does the costume department have 
when dealing with the visual concepts that they've already come up with before the movies go into production, do you have leeway and, and how do you work within the MCU to create these amazing costumes? The key thing there for, cause that's actually something that we talk about often um, is I got to give a big shout out to visual development at Marvel because they do so much actually for my career. I'm going to back up. I'll get to it. But um, for me, uh, meeting uh, Ryan Minerding, head of visual development. At the time, that's when visual development started. So it was Ryan uh, Minerding and Charlie Wynn, um, who are both just incredible artists, just amazing artists. Um, and what ended up happening is, is like when they were trying to formulate and kind of figure it out, at least in terms of like VizDev and how it was forming and everything, um, Kevin uh, Feige was really instrumental in trying to make sure Ultimately, it's been hugely successful. He is like head nerd. He's very much so the person that's like, we will not compromise the look of our characters to anyone, meaning that they need to look like themselves, but be, you know, awesome and spectacular and all that. But they have a way about them where he really wanted to honor that and stick true to it. So for me, as a costume illustrator, I was used to kind of kind of getting direction and kind of taking direction from the costume designer as well. And this was like something different where there was a merging between concept art mm. and then co traditional costume illustration. So it became like this thing where it was kind of shifting. And what I loved about working with Ryan and Charlie was, was that I got to see joy. I got to see joy of painting, joy of art, the love of actual creation, composition, um, the lighting, the cinematic, like the birth of that cinematic universe, I was literally watching it happen. Um, and that inspired me to do more or more to gear my career towards concept art. So that's when I started saying like, oh, I think I, that's like, I, I hadn't thought about it until that point. Mm. I was a traditional costume illustrator, which is like more like being dictated to and kind of doing that. But concept art was like, you're using your brain and you're actually thinking about ideas and all of those things. So the way that those things kind of came together was, for me, I was asking questions. I'm very inquisitive. So I, was, I would ask Charlie questions. I would ask Ryan questions. And even when Kevin Feige came in, I asked them one question. And I said, you know, when you're thinking about these things and like we're showing the stuff and how to sell, right? I said, what's your advice? And he just looked at me and he said, make it cool. And I thought about it. And that's all he said. And he like left and walked off. It was like super mysterious. And I was like, okay, it's like, make it cool, kid. You know, that type of deal. And like, that's what I remembered. And so from that point, I had set out to be like, how can I paint better? How can I paint more cinematically? How can I do this? How can I do that? Um, and I think that as far as costume design goes, it truly is collaborative. What they end up doing is they go a lot back and forth. So BizDev is doing their thing, costumes doing their thing. They kind of overlap in a lot of different ways. So it really has to be a cohesive collaborative um, uh, process to work. Mm. But I'm not going to take away from the fact that BizDev does do a lot of design. They do a lot of design on the projects. And that's per based off of Marvel just really respecting their characters and wanting to make sure that everything flows cohesive from a design language visual language way um, and then also honoring the history of these characters and making sure that source material is key like that's the key thing not like what you research to a degree like research is obviously important but the source material and honoring that that's key for marvel like you must nail that and then expand it to something real and cool right well what i find really interesting too is you know, everyone thinks about costume, comic book costumes as being, well, it's spandex or it's, but it, it, what I love about the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe costumes is they make so much use of different kinds of fabrics. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're intermixing costumes. Recently, we, we saw something like the Eternals that mm -hmm. had really interesting uh, builds to those costumes using different different right. fabrics and things like that. And in your job as, a, as an illustrator, like you said, you were working on the computer because you could you could call up different fabrics in your designs, which had to have been incredibly helpful. So how much does your concept art inform not just selling an idea, but once you're really getting into the nitty gritty with a costume designer, developing which fabrics are, are you using? Are you able to say, okay, well, it's, I'm going to do an illustration with leather, or I'm going to do an illustration with suede, or I'm going to do... Do you, do you have a lot of input on that area, like the fabrics itself? 
to a degree, like if you're conceptualizing, like you're working just purely concept without a costume designer, you have to come up with those things. And then you, it's more like character design, right? So it's like closest to what you would do for like video games or animation, but you're designing the whole thing to look at the character. But in cinematic land, when you're working with the costume designer, a lot of those choices are also there as they're sourcing fabrics, they're going out and looking for stuff. They're infusing the costumes with history, like in terms of saying like, okay, this should be this or this color or whatever, like going back and forth. Um, but the design tone is kind of set from Marvel, you know, in terms of like what they want their brand to be, what they want their product to be. And then everybody kind of fits within that mold. Um, so the choices for me, I've just learned as a traditional illustrator, just in general, that I, I focus on in my work, trying to make sure you can tell the difference between things. So it's like mm. it's leather, but that's chiffon versus, you know, <laughs> that. And like, it's very like, I try to make sure that you can tell what those things are or how things fold or how they drape. And that's just the costume, you know, the costume knowledge or the, the training that I've had from costume designers. It really is pinnacle. Um, their job is pinnacle to that process because they're the ones that also not only come up with a lot of the ideas and the research and kind of the, like bringing the heart to the character, but also they make the physical costume. So a bad translation of a costume is actually um, can be the failing point of a movie, right? So it's if you have, you could have the best design in the world, but if you can't make it, or if you can't realize it, that's what we all see, right? So that's kind of the thing where those two processes really merge together. And I do feel like they really do support each other. I feel like they're two separate jobs, but they are very symbiotic. Like they, they should work. The pipeline should come together and work in, you know, in one direction. And I think it often, you know, does. Now you worked on a number of, well, three of the Hunger Games movies, right? Mm -hmm. I, not the first one, but the uh, the three you worked Correct. on, Crouching Fire, Mocking Jay Part 1 and 2. What I love about those films is the costume design when you get to Pan Am to the Capitol, you know, everybody, when you're working on, the, there's some amazing costume work in that, whether it's, you know, Stanley Tucci or... <laughs> When you're working on something like that, do you go back and, and, and go into the books for inspiration or are you going to art museums? Or are you flipping through? How do you, how do you even begin to start designing the costumes in something like, like a Hunger Games film? It's the books, it's the script. Um, and then also just sitting with the designers and coming up with ideas like, for Catching Fire, that was one of my good friends, like one of my best friends now, Trish Somerville, um, love her to death. Um, we just bonded instantly. I feel like in terms of uh, that design process, Trish is very specific. So she was very like, I want to try this, I want to do that. But like, I've never worked with someone specifically. I just, the secret is fun. We just had fun. Like, I think a lot of it was not even talking about work, it would be like, what do you like to do? Like restaurants, like where do you like to travel? And, but then in between that is interweaved with like creativity. So I felt like a lot of the creativity was boosted by just having the mood feel lighter and have everybody really trying to focus. The script in itself kind of dictates a lot of that. We do look back at the books to make sure that we're getting the descriptions right and kind of what things are. But the books also lead Books translations are always interesting to me because when you read a book, it's always so good because it's in your head and in your mind, you imagine what that is to be, right? So the film translation is a little bit harder because now you know everyone's read this book and they have their own feelings of what this is going to be and you're now translating it to what the cinematic version will be. Um, so it's, it's a balance, um, but a key, again, the key secret there, a lot of it is research. Tons of research, tons of silhouette study, fashion research. Um, it kind of all kind of lends itself to the process. Um, so in those films, it was lots of fashion. Obviously, when you go to the Capitol, it's supposed to be high fashion and really avant-garde. So you have um, um, Elizabeth Banks, who played um, Ify Trinket. Mm -hmm. she was wonderful, did a lot of those designs. She was great. Um, and she just kind of was like really fun and very much so wanting to, you know, expand that character and have fun with it. Um, and so from that one, I moved with Trish to Kurt and Bart, um, a duo team, right? Um, also just fun to work for. We just joked around and we laughed a lot. We did a lot of research, a lot of fashion research. And then we also just kind of like tried to play with silhouette and form and function and all of, all of those things. Um, I think that it kind of comes in, but I can't take away from the fact that 
between all three of them, Trish and Kurt and Bart, is a very talented, they're very talented, but they also like read and know a lot of things. They know a lot about fashion and history of like clothing. Um, so that part really helped to kind of expand that, you know. Mm. Well, then you you also, after that, I love the fact that you jumped back into a Marvel, but on the Fox side, because you worked on The Wolverine and X-Men Days of Future Past. I guess that was back with Louise Mingenbach again on X-Men Days of Future Past. Um, was it different working on a Marvel project that was at a different studio as opposed yes. to working on an MCU film? Much different. Um, it's much different in a very nerd frustration way. <laughs> so I'm just going to say that out loud. I've said it before, but working with Marvel, like that's why I'm so happy that a lot of the properties are going back. Marvel will get their characters right. I have no qualms about that. I have no, I literally, I'm like, just can't wait. I can't wait for all the stuff that's coming up. I can't wait to see how they're going to do it. Because ultimately I know that they're going to do it right. It's the little details. So I'll give you an example. For me, Marvel, the difference between working for like an like MCU versus like a different studio is MCU won't cheap out or won't compromise something like they they want it to be correct. So like, I feel like, you know, um, I'm trying to think of an example that I could give, like, let's say Nightcrawler. Let's just take like Nightcrawler. Okay. Right? So we know what that version looks like. It was awesome. It was cool. Like the whole sequence, everything, right? But I feel like what what MCU would do is like, you know how Nightcrawler has those like inverted feet? Right, yep. They wouldn't put him in like, like foot, like, like foot, like, like how they did the Hobbit. Like they wouldn't put them in like blue feet and be like, we're going to call it a day. They're going to like put him in a thing that makes it look like he has those inverted, like it's the little details and like right. knowing the characters, that's the difference or like making sure that, so, or even like we said, maybe with MCU, we'll finally see Wolverine in his classic costume with his mask. Like, it's that stuff that I'm excited about. But when you work with the studios, you're doing a lot of compromise. And then sometimes you're dealing with people that don't know the properties as well, or they're making changes that kind of go, it's that balance that I talked about, right? It's like that balance will go just slightly far enough to where you're like, that's not that character that I liked or that I loved, or that character would never wear that color or whatever it is. So that that would be the frustration. So I had a lot of frustrating kind of like, you know, like, no, that or or characters getting cut that should be there that are now gone that we drew. And then they're like, oh, we took them out. And I'm like, they're literally the main part of that story. How did you take them out? It's stuff <laughs> like that, you know, like that's the key kind of nerd thing. Um, but that's the that's one of the bigger differences for me is knowing that they'll get it right. Or even just if you look at something like um like a uh, civil war or any of those, like uh, any of the MCU movies. The one thing I appreciate too is like movement. They they take the time to say Captain America moves like this, but Black Panther moves like this, but Wanda does the thing with like she moves like. There's all these little details, which I think for like for in the nerd sense, yeah. one of my biggest critiques for X Men would just be everybody. It's just people shooting powers. It's like I shoot lightning, but I shoot a. But like, okay, great. But like, how do those things work? And how do you move? And how do you fight? Like, how can we get this to where it doesn't just feel like a bunch of people just going like this? Like, that's my, you know what I mean? MCU will get that right. They always do. Now, you also worked in the DC realm. You worked on Man of Steel and you worked on Justice League. So, I mean, you really have worked on the great pantheons of characters how was it going over to the distinguished competition and work <laughs> and work at Warner Brothers on on these properties? And what were what were some of the differences like working for a director underneath like Zack Snyder, who was very well versed in in the comic panels and obviously all the way back to Watchmen? I mean, he obviously I have a lot of the books that they put out a lot of books in the making of that film, and he really revered the comic panels that Dave Gibbons had drawn in, in Watchmen. So when you went to work on Man of Steel and, um, and something like Justice League, what was it like working under him? And, and were you frustrated? Was there a nerd frustration over at Warner Brothers as well? 
No, so the, the nerd frustration ends with Zach because Zach's amazing and um, super nice, nicest guy ever. Very much so a part of the process, but also a huge nerd as well. So <laughs> like, that definitely doesn't happen in the same, in the same way. He really wants to get it right. Um, so it was an interesting process because for me, Man of Steel is the one, the job that I remember as when I like had a level up. It's the first time that I felt like it's the first job where I used photographs in my work, like while I was actually able to collage things and make it look more like concept art. So it's the first time I actually understood what that meant. Like I was trying to kind of transition because if you look back at my early work, it's more fashiony and more like, you know, like like more fashion proportions or costume mm. illustration. Um, Man of Steel is the first time I was working with artists like Warren Manser and Constantine Sakaris and Keith Christensen um, and, and Natividad. Like these are like massive, massively great artists. Um, and so I was sitting sandwiched between all of them and just trying to learn. Um, and so the first breakthrough that I actually had in my concept art career where I felt like I was actually understanding how to create an idea and like come up with cool images was the tribunal for Man of Steel. So, the, you know, the pompous, arrogant people that are like, Krypton's not gonna explode, that was <laughs> right. my climate, right? Um, so the tracery of the headpieces and all of that stuff was like the first time that I felt like I had drawn something and illustrated something. And the idea, the thought process was, was um, I kind of thought about like, we're looking all of the research that the costume designer gave was very like almost like renaissance or like middle ages, like that, like those types of shapes, right? And I just kept getting stuck because we're drawing those and it just didn't look sci-fi enough. So I finally had this idea where I said, what if we reverse them inside out and like all of those Pope type shapes and all that, what do those things look like on the inside? So I put the inside on the outside and that's wow. where that idea came from so all the caging and all that was just let me take these shapes and then see if i can create that and that instant was the first time i really got it and that was the first thing that i sold or was able to sell like when they went to the meeting that zach was like he was excited about what i had drawn and he was like that's my movie and that to me was like i was like okay cool now i think i understand how to do that, you know, or at least I, it was the first instance where I felt like I was successful at it. So I remember Man of Steel like that. Um, and then the other one, Justice League was years later, or a few years later, more season, first time back. Um, and um, and it just was, a, it was a different experience, but same, the same, like I loved the translations. I loved looking at the concept art for Wonder Woman and seeing how that translated from the comic book to the screen. There was some really good design work there. Um, and so I just enjoyed it. Right. Um, well, I, I, it, which brings you right after Justice League, it brings you to Black Panther. Mm -hmm. Now, you had spoken earlier uh, at the beginning of your career as, a, as an actor, you were being given one role repeatedly over and over again. And you had said that you were looking for better representation, not in terms of your agent, but mm -hmm. better representation in terms of who you, you are, <laughs> you know, who entire, an entire group of people are. They're not just one kind of person. Correct. Well, Black Panther represented on so many different levels uh, a first in Hollywood, a tentpole property where you had black female production designers. You know, you had all, I mean, a costume designers. You had all kinds of people, some of the greatest actors assembled. I mean, talk about an Avengers assemble and Black Panther, the, the actors, I mean, it was incredible. And the representation represented something that really had never happened in Hollywood history before. Mm -hmm. What did it mean to you to come to work on Black Panther? Black Panther, so I remember Black Panther specifically. I'm so glad you made that correlation or that connection because it's a big one for me. So Black Panther, um, I should state, I was working on both Black Panther and A Wrinkle in Time at the same time. I did... Uh, through costume designer Jeffrey Curland, who I've worked with many times, Inception and all of those things. Um, Jeffrey designs or was designing at the time the Governor's Ball. So like it's the it's the place that everybody goes after they win their Oscar. It's like mm -hmm. the big party, right? So he would design like what it was and then he designed the costumes for it. So he had brought me in in 2016 um, to do, I put together a team of illustrators and the, the governor's ball was designed to look like uh, the, the, the Brown Derby 
the restaurant that has all the sure. characters. Oh yeah. So like it was in pastels and pinks, but then he wanted all of these big framed, like, you know, 20 by 30, like big framed uh, caricatures. So it was like producers, directors, all these things. Now, granted, when we got the list, each one of us, I think, did like 20 something drawings. And it was like nine of us. So they were all over the walls and each illustrator had to do like 20 drawings. So what ended up happening with Ava is Ava wasn't, um, or Ava wasn't on the list initially at first um, in terms of directors. I was like, it's a black female director. I would really love to draw her. So that was like the first, I was like, she has to be on this list. So I drew her, didn't think anything of it because I had all these other illustrations to do, but I, I liked my illustration, put it out and it was up on the wall. That year, Ava didn't go to the Oscars because she did a benefit uh, for Flint, for, uh, for Flint, Michigan, for the water crisis, right? So she okay. did that as opposed to going... So I didn't think anything of it. A couple of months passed and I just posted on Twitter. I say, Ava didn't come to this. You know, I, this is my illustration of her um, to, to honor, to find a way to make sure that I was honoring her and all the work she does. And she saw it on Twitter. She liked it and she followed me. And I was like, oh my gosh. So that was like, just as a fan, I was like, that's great. Then I got a call the next day uh, from a producer saying, hey, we're working on this project for Disney Wrinkle in Time, and Ava DuVernay wants you to come in and interview for this position. So I was like, what? So I go in and interview, and she hired me, which was great. So <laughs> that was how I met Ava um, and worked on that project and had a really great time in developing stuff and working and doing costume and stuff like that. Um, and then um, contrary to that, after we've been working on that a few months, Ruth Carter contacted me to do Black Panther. And I was just so ecstatic and so excited. She was actually my first, like out of that entire run, she was my first Black boss, which was also really just kind wow. of, it was like a, a, a huge deal. Um, and so now that I can kind of tie those things together and going back and forth, I was very aware because I've got my little daughter, I've got my daughter, and I wanted to make sure, everything that I've done is also make sure that people coming up or especially people of color have an easier time and don't have that frustration that I had. I didn't want people to go through the frustration of being like, where am I on screen? All of that stuff. So I was very aware in that moment. It was like the best moment ever between Black Panther and Wrinkle that things were changing. So I was like, my daughter will grow up seeing a little Black girl go to space and have this inner, you know, intergalactic, you know, you know trip and also seeing Black Panther. Like she will see those things. And so her experience, she's growing up in the experience that I wish I had. So I was very, it was a full circle moment for me. And I really took it in. It's one of the few moments like that you get in life where you're very aware of what's happening as it's happening. Not like I have to look back and be like, oh, that was like, I was very aware in that moment that it was a change. And that was a full circle moment for me where I felt like I had come full circle to like, doing what I had set out to do, which was making sure that I was a part of something that was changing. What's interesting is uh, Black, both Black Panther and, and Wrinkle in Time came out in 2018, and your first movie, The Mummy, was 2008. Mm -hmm. So uh, th this represented a 10-year journey, and you actually, like you said, you, you got to a place where you hoped things would eventually wind up. Correct. And, I mean, that's pretty, I, I once heard, I think it was Nicholas Meyer, many people have said this, that it it takes 10 years to become an overnight success in Hollywood. <laughs> you know, 10 years of a decade of toil and trouble. But, <laughs> but, but now that you're, now that you're here, now that you've gotten this place, did you feel, did you feel that you had, that you had accomplished that you'd come to the place that you wanted to be? And not just that there was representation, but do you personally had been on this journey and and did you feel satisfied you would you would you would arrive to at this place i think so i think that um throughout my career like i never i think growing up in film it doesn't j like people will say it jade you for me the one carry on that i have through all of it and it just annoys my wife to no end is that and like people in general is that I never get excited about stuff until it happens because I'm used to people saying, we got this great project and then it just disappears or whatever it is, right? That's so right. very much so like you won't see me excited about a trip until I am there. Like we're going to France or whatever. As soon as we step off that plane and I'm in France, I'm like, this is awesome. Until that point, I don't know what's going to happen. So I think that in terms of like a career, I think that I didn't know 
I feel like as I look back on my career, I was kind of experiencing it in real time, but also it's a lot of work. So it's one of those things where stuff goes by, like to a degree, even just hearing you read back some of the stuff, I, like, I'm like, oh yeah, I did do that. Like it just kind of all melts together. So I don't think that it was ever a moment where I was like, I've arrived at this moment or I've arrived in this career so much as it just felt like the goal that I had set to try to make sure that things were changing had happened. So I just felt like I settled more into that. Um, and then as far as the work goes, I always look at work as like, I see the actual job. So I don't look at like a claim or like, ooh, I worked on this thing so much as I look to just try to do my best job or do the best work. And I focus on the craft. And I think that I, acting taught me that too, is like, you're not trying to be famous. You're trying to be the best actor you can be. Mm -hmm. You're trying to do a good job. You're trying to find the job and do it well. And so I think that my training has always been that. I never look at all the super silly stuff or like, ooh, I made all these people or celebrities. It's like, I'm like, people are people, job is job. And I very much so try to just do the best job that I can do and represent myself professionally and well. Um, but I think that there's a lot of things that like, I do look back on it. I'm like, oh, that was a great accomplishment. Like working with Madonna, with Ariane Phillips, like she's become one of my best friends in life period. But it's also been one of those things where every time I worked with her, I've experienced something that's just amazing. Like where I'm like, that's an amazing experience or like being at rehearsal, it's midnight and there's no, the stage is all set at least for the tour itself. And I'm sitting with Madonna or with um, with Ariane and Madonna's rehearsing and we're right there and there's no one else. And knowing that like in a month or so when the show actually happens, there's going to be thousands of people in the same place we're standing. That's a moment where you just take that in and you say, that's awesome. You know, <laughs> like, that's cool. You know, um, it's a really cool and, and grateful. So I feel very great. I feel instead of feeling um i've never been asked this question so sorry i'm kind of rambling no i love it i think it's i never feel like i've accomplished stuff so much as i feel grateful mm -hmm. i just feel grateful that i'm able i feel grateful that i'm able to provide for my family by doing what i love to do right which is amazing i mean that's one of the great things that working in the arts and being able to make a living in it is one of the great privileges of of life really but you know, back to Black Panther. What what I love, what I love about Black Panther so much is that the whole idea of embracing the idea of Afrofuturism. You know, the that that you're you're creating this world of Wakanda, but the costume design, you know, it, it really embraced. It, it could have gone in a different direction, but it, it really embraced what seemed to be traditional. Uh, it felt very authentic, even though it's a fantasy film set in a land that doesn't exist. But it really embraced, I think, the the idea that Wakanda is an African nation. And yes. and the history, I, and I'm curious for that film, did you go back and, and look into specific places in Africa throughout history to to inspire or or inform the design work? Definitely. So even when Ruth was going in an interview for it, we were looking at Timbuktu, Mansa, Ma, Mansa Musa, um, all of the different stuff to try and kind of find the historical correlation. You know, obviously, mm -hmm. it's like the gold is vibranium or all the gold that he had is vibranium, like that type of thing, the impenetrable place. So it's like a very much so like uh, understanding like that core of it in a historical sense and then expanding it out. Ruth had on the walls of the costume department, um, she had done all this research and she had gone because she had done Roots. She had done the re, the re, you know, mm -hmm. the remake of Roots. So she had already gone to Africa and she had all this research from all these different tribes. So the best part about Black Panther for me, especially being African-American, is like, I feel like we're always just slightly removed or like, or very removed from African culture at large. We don't, it's not something we grew up with. And then even when you do, it's something that it's kind of on the outskirts. So it's like, oh, it's Black History Month. Let's wear this kente cloth or whatever it is. But right. you don't really know what that means. That cloth could mean like you're a jerk or something. Like you <laughs> have no idea. Like and you're not researching it. So the best thing for me for Black Panther is it opened up um, between Ruth and all the research she had on the walls, all the different tribes, what their names were, all of this stuff. And then she had a, like a map of Wakanda and kind of plotting that out and like the history of that. And we had all the comic books and stuff. 
um, and playing music. It just was the first time I felt like in life where I actually started to learn, actually learn and retain African culture or like how to wow. pronounce things or like, who is this? What is this tribe? Why do they put that in their hair? Like all of that stuff. It was the first time that I actually felt like I was engaging in it and not just being like, oh, you know, we're from Africa at some point. Like it felt like I was actually understanding what that is. And then it got really, it actually got frustrating for me because then I would try to like, um, I talked to this about my co-founder or my friend Mike a lot, um, Michael Wandi, um, about how when you try to search African things, it becomes very clear how disjointed and not paid attention to they are. And what I mean by that is if I'm searching for something that's Zimbabwean, I want Zimbabwean, but Google will show me all of Africa. Like it shows me <laughs> it, can't, it can't focus on like, this is just Zimbabwean. I'll start getting Nigerian stuff in there and Kenyan stuff in there. And it gets really confusing because if you want to learn, it's really difficult. So that became something that I've started to learn and kind of like kind of even out and kind of say, okay, I'm focused on the Dinka tribe today or I'm focused on the Himba or like whatever it is and trying to kind of infuse that into the work. Um, and that's that was probably the most powerful thing for me for Black Panther um, was getting a chance to work with Ruth, hearing music that I'm accustomed to, like feeling like I didn't have to code switch at work. It was awesome. It was so great. <laughs> it was the best experience. Well, that's really interesting. What do you mean by that code switching at work? So code switch is just like, it's a, it's the term where it's just like you have like the way you talk to your black friends and you have the way you talk to everybody else, like, and like, or being at work. And the fun thing about Ruth is like, it's like, I hadn't realized it because up until that point, I had still been, um, we were talking about the career. 2019 is the first time I sat next to another black artist. So started You're kidding. in- Completely. 11 years? So it, was, it was like, was so 2007, yeah, correct. Or 2008, 2007 to 2019, I was pretty much, I hadn't sat next to another Black artist. So that was a, that was a difficult thing, but even just having a Black boss, like I'd come in and, you know, Ruth was blasting like Rihanna or something or Drake or someone like, and it would just be great. Cause I was just like, Oh, this is different. Like it just felt like I was at home or like, I felt like I could like be myself more. Yeah. Um, I'd be like, not, I don't want to say uptight, just not, it just felt more like more relaxed and more like myself. Yeah. Um, and so that was the first time that I had that kind of experience. Um, and it just felt really great to be around and it felt powerful. It felt empowering. Um, it was something I don't think I would have, I, I, I noticed, you notice it, but you just move, you don't notice it. You kind of just move through, you know. And, and Ruth brought home the, uh, the gold statue. She sure did. We're very proud of her, very excited. Um, and also just like, she's, she's been one of the better collaborators that I've had in my career in terms of just being a friend and super supportive, like very supportive of like goals, ambitions. She's always there to make sure she's like, okay, what do you want to do? Okay, I'm going to help support that. Like that's, that's Ruth to, you know, her core. You know, there's a lot of talk now about obviously over the last couple of years about representation and everything that's gone on in the country from George Floyd to BLM. And, but I'm curious, I mean, from a work perspective, like you were just telling what it was like to finally have a black boss and work with a black artist. What do you think is the real, how, how can true representation in the workplace and true representation, how do, how does that happen? What, what path can we take to get there? It's one thing to talk about it or read about it or listen to someone lecture you about C, uh, CRT or something, but in, in a workplace, like yeah. something like this, how, how do we get there? It's, I think to me, I mean, it's a really hard question to answer. It, it, yeah, I just thought I'd throw it out there since, you know, yeah, on, yeah. on this journey, you had brought up the idea of representation in the beginning and now yeah. you're working on the film that, really had it broke through in so many it was a i mean a tent pole movie that grossed over a billion dollars mm -hmm. that 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 was predominantly a black cast i mean there's you had two guys that were who who worked for peter jackson the tolkien white guys <laughs> you know <laughs> and then, and it but it was a really important movie in a, on a number of different levels not just for the artists who made it but for the people the audiences that never had something like this before 
Now they can always point to it and go, here's this, and it probably is going to lead. We got Wakanda Forever coming out soon. Well, at the end of this year. The simplest answer that I could give, at least in terms of figuring it out, is Black Panther was hugely successful because it gave... It just, it didn't exist before, at least in terms of like, it's like people, specifically like Black people have been begging to be able to play and participate, like in sci-fi and in fantasy and have those stories be told and have their point of view told. So as soon as you put that on screen, representation is very important. Like kids, like seeing yourself, I had to grow up and I loved all those movies. I watched The Goonies, I watched All of Willow, all those fun things, Flight right. of the Navigator. And I didn't realize it, but I was always using my imagination to see myself in those things with people that didn't look like me. Mm -hmm. So as you get older, you're just one of those things where like, how come is, how come that is, or how come we're not allowed to participate? And it kind of causes this pipeline problem, right? Where people are like, so it also causes an insular problem, which is like, you start to get, if you're not allowed to play in an arena, you move on. So one of the things we've talked about is like, people are like, oh, like, if there's that thought of like black people don't do this or they don't do that or they're not into this or not into that, which is like wrong. But it's also one of those things where it's just like, hey, let us do fantasy too. I'd love to see, you know, like some, you know, a black night elf or something like any of that stuff. It's like, where is that? Why don't we have like black dragon riders or like whatever it is? Like, I'm like, where, like, where's the fun? So right now, the key thing is to just tell stories with everyone like, and do specific points of view so that people can be heard. There's so much out there culturally from different cultures that we have not seen on screen. Meaning that it's not even like you have to hype it up or turn it or conceptually turn it into something else. Just putting it on screen and getting it right is enough. Meaning if you wanna tell some Filipino episodic story and you put that on screen, I wanna watch it because I haven't seen it. I, I completely people. agree with you. You know what I mean? So that's the first thing is get, and then also empowering people of color behind the scenes so that there's more people able to tell stories or to catch things like, hey, you know, like if I was there, I would have said that's kind of problematic or a little bit offensive. But since I'm not there, it goes through and now you have a big talking point and you got it wrong again. You know, it's like, it's just trying to make sure it's more like the world. When you go outside in the world, you're around all kinds of different people. Why aren't we seeing that on screen? And, right. and when we do see it, have it be natural as well, because, right. you know, the fun, funny thing about to me about Black Panther was when I was watching Black Panther, I wasn't thinking to myself, wow, this is a predominantly black cast. I'm like, this movie kicks ass. That's, that's I mean, that's exactly what you want. It, it's a great story. Well told and the way they introduced T'Challa in um, Civil War, mm -hmm. you know, T'Chaka, his father. What a great introduction to the character. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't think, aside from the obvious fact he's called Black Panther and he was introduced in 66, you know, as a, as a response to what was going on at the time, it never occurred to me that I'm watching a Black character. I was just looking at a kick-ass character right. and the way he could fight. And like you said, I never, I've never heard anybody say this, but to get the, the fighting and T'Challa's movements and the way he used his claws and the, the, his suit was different than say Captain America, you know, right. and watching that was really key. And then when you meet the Dora Milaje and the way they fight, they have their own fighting style and, and all that stuff was, it was great. And, and in terms of representation, I mean, I just was watching a cool, a cool movie. I went to the John Campy and I went to the Hollywood report Hollywood bowl. Mm -hmm. And we saw, we saw black Panther when, when the live orchestra played, and it was incredible. And you really appreciated that score too, which score, was also, right. you know, a lot of tra traditional instruments were used to play on that score. It was great. Yeah. And well, I'm glad that, that, that I hope, you know, that, that we're going to see a lot more, we're getting a lot more uh, different kinds of stories even now. I mean, even seeing the breakthrough like Korean television is having on Netflix. I mean, Something like a Squid Game, you know, again, a different right. culture. Americans, five years ago, I'm like, yeah, I'm a big fan of Korean cinema. I watch a lot of it, Train to Busan or The Host or Memories of Murder or something. And now Americans were like, why would I watch Korean films? Well, see what you're missing? The excuse is, the excuse is finally disappearing because it's gone. there's 
much proof that it doesn't work. So you can't say this won't sell all the stuff that people have said to keep people out. It won't sell internationally. Oh, it won't do this. Oh, the, you'll never be able to cast, you know, Halle Berry in a leading role unless she's cast next to a white person. Like all of that stuff is, it's gone because you can't, you can't say that because there's examples now that that's not the case. Yeah. So I feel like that's kind of the best, one of the best things that's come out of it. And I feel like we're in a rebirth period where we finally have the opportunity to hear from other people, like to hear different stories or to hear, to see points of view and also have them represented in a way that's true to them. Like, yeah. you know, even if you take something um, as simple as like Moana, right? Just hearing, watching Moana but then hearing them sing in their own language, you don't have to know what that says. You can feel it like that. And that's, and it's, it's true to that culture. Like, that's what I want to see. Cause that's the most, we haven't seen that stuff. So you can right. literally do so much for free by just putting it on screen, you know? And like with everything else, all you need is great characters and a great story. Well told. Correct. People will show up. People Correct. show up, you People know, no longer. Up. Well, after you did Black Panther, you worked on another film that I adored, and I think a lot of people did. You worked on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, yes. jumping back to the late '60s, you know, and and in and, and our the city we live in here. Um, what was it like to then go from something like? Uh, actually, I want to talk about two two more indie minded movies. One of the things I wanted to ask you about because no one talks about this movie enough is Karen Kusama's Destroyer. Uh, the Nicole Kidman movie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I that movie knocked me out. Now I know it's not like the costume design; it's mostly people in street clothes. Yes, but we drew them. It was still illustrated. Yeah. I, oh no, absolutely. Yeah. And I was—that's what I was going to ask you about. I mean, I Destroyer knocked me out, and it takes place in in the real world. You know, in the streets of the hard streets of L.A. or whatever. When you go from something like you've been working on a lot of these big fantasy epics whether it's wrinkle in time or black panther then you transition back to a movie that's set in the real world on the, on the on the streets with the asphalt and the chain link fences and but that like you just said it also has to be illustrated how do you change it up how do you approach a movie like a destroyer when you are coming off of big marvel movies um the key thing for that is you just dive into character and trying to find for me, that those are opportunities to learn about clothing, fashion, how clothes fit, like how that, like you can draw that jacket, but if it's tailored, it says something different about someone than if it's baggy or if it doesn't fit, right? Mm. So those are the times that I would really settle into trying to figure out like proportion. Like if I make the waist higher on these pants, it makes the legs look longer or vice versa. And that's all costume designer, like 101. It's all the little tricks that they do, you know, to basically you know, change the body, inform things, inform the story. Um, I believe that that costume was uh, Audrey Fisher, who I worked with on True Blood. Mm. Uh, so that was one of the ones where I kind of came in and we were doing the illustration um, to try to like kind of show how beaten down she was and how like, like and the strength of it and kind of trying to erase, not erase, but like kind of immerse Nicole Kidman in this character to where it's not Nicole Kidman you know it's like it's a that type of deal and you guys succeeded I mean I that was one of the things her her costumes in that particular film were perfect I mean in terms of like you said immersive well you you went from there I mean you know of course you did work on things like uh Captain Marvel which I love you know that was but, but um uh the uh the uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, a film that has amazing costumes. I mean, in, in terms of evoking a period, uh, where do you begin on a project like that? Um, oh, man. Um, how do you even remotely, like, start? <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's it's so interesting because it's it's a Hollywood. Here's what I want to ask you. Yeah. Let me be more specific. You know, Tarantino was doing these alternate histories, like Inglorious Bastards. Yeah. And obviously, we win the world. We win World War War Two. We kill Hitler. In Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it, which is a fairy tale. So on one hand, 
you're evoking a period that you have all this this uh, reality and and yet at the same time it's almost a heightened reality. You've got a version of Bruce Lee, you, you know, you've got a version of these characters. You've got a version of Roman Polanski, and you have a version of Sharon Tate. But they're almost they're not supposed to be necessarily authentic, mm-hmm. but more or or were they? So this was, so that, that film is like, I was trying to think about it because I was trying to figure out how to start. Um, uh, that film was again with my friend that I mentioned before, Ariane Phillips. So like, again, every little milestone I have in my career somehow points back to Ariane. So for me, she told me that she had an interview for it. And I was like, I have wanted to work with Quentin Tarantino or work for Quentin Tarantino, you know, for forever. So like, if you can do this, you must bring me along. I have to do this with you, you know? And of course it happened. And so we're there. Um, And Quentin is a very hands-on director. He's pretty much what you see is what you get. So like his personality, the bigness of it, the hype, like it felt good to work with someone that loves movies, like actually loves them. Like it's not, this isn't for show. It's not like a part of his persona. That's Quentin in a nutshell. He loves film. He's very particular and very specific. So he's very much so like, it must be this green from this thing or this cigarette box. (laughs) You know, it's very like homage, but also like he's got his own thought processes. So breaking down that, he was very hands-on with Ariane in terms of like the costumes and stuff like that, but very collaborative as well. He had very specific points. Like he's like, this must be yellow. Like this sweater must be yellow but then the rest of it you can kind of expand on, but it has to be this because he's looking at a reference. The key thing that Quentin does that's really cool, especially for someone that's, you know, that that's not my generation, not my time period. Um, every week during production, he would screen movies for us. So the crew would come and he would screen movies that he watched or things he was looking at for in order to make Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So that was probably one of the cooler experiences I've had in my career is every week we go to Quentin's theater and we sit down and the crew's in there and he gives a little intro and says what we're gonna watch. And he tells a story about the directors he's met or like what he's done here. They show trailers. So there's the old school (laughs) trailers, the whole thing. And there's food and popcorn, all the stuff. It was just the greatest experience. And me and Ariane would just sit and watch these classic films that he looked at to make Once Upon a Time in Hollywood while they're also making Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So when you start approaching the historical characters like Sharon Tate and all that, there was great respect paid to making sure that they got them right. Um, There was a lot of back and forth with the Tate family to make sure that that was going on. You know, there was a lot in there, you know, sensitive issues, but a lot of different things in there that they kind of, he kind of made sure to kind of put in there and pay homage to them. Um, And for a costume perspective, we were just trying to make sure that the characters were correct, but also Ariane has a really great sense of style. So she also wanted to make them look you know, it, as their best self without overtaking the character where you're like, that costume is too much. It's just the perfect amount of style mixed in with who they are. Wow. I mean, you guys did a fantastic job. The costumes in that film are, I mean, everything. In it. The, I remember walking on, on, I was working on with John Campia when we had a studio in Hollywood when they were shooting on Hollywood Boulevard and, you know, seeing billboards for like the invaders, the Roy <laughs> Thinnis, and, and, you know, and I was, this is amazing. I loved it. It's fantastic. Well, listen, this has been a great conversation. I could talk to you for another hour and a half. Um, where you, you have an online presence. You have a great website. Where can people find you online? You can find me on Instagram at uh, Phil, P-H-I-L underscore Boutte, B-O-U-T-T-E. Um, I'm also on Twitter at P. Boutte. Um, and then for me, I have to give a shout out to, I started a company with co-founders Michael Wandy and actor Aldous Hodge, who's going to be playing Hawkman in Black Adam. We're very proud of him. <laughs> By the uh, way, how great is that costume? It, it's pretty amazing. And that's, also, that's also Curtin Bart. Wow. So I mean, was, <laughs> we, we could talk about that for forever, but that's one of the things. So I wanted to give a shout out to the company 9B. Um, 9B is my company. It's the first black owned concept art collective. Nice. Um, and so when we talk about diversity and inclusion, when you talk about my plans for that, that's been the plan, which is we are trying to infuse behind the scenes with the pipeline of artists to make sure that specifically for a lot of us, we 
when we come together and talk, a lot of artists have that same experience I had, which was I haven't sat next to any black artists. I work at a video game company. There's 400 employees and there's two black people and we never work on the same thing. So we've kind of come together, created this collective. We have over 70 artists worldwide um, and we basically work on projects um, and we bring in artists and we form a team and then we art direct them from week to week with the director, producer, costume designer. Production. That's amazing. And that's congratulations. Kind of Thank you very much. That's what I've been doing to do that. So you can also find us on Instagram at 9B Collective. Does, does that have a website? Yes, it's 9bcollective.com. Okay. Now, you've got some pretty interesting movies coming up that you've worked on. Is there anything you can tell us about? Um, currently, I can't, I can't say much, but I will say I am working on, with 9B, um, and with costume designer Maya's Rubia, I'm working on the live action version of DC Warner Brothers Blue Beetle. Um, and I'm also, I just finished doing concept work with costume designer Ann Foley, who I mentioned before, for He-Man Masters of the Universe, uh, the live action version of that. So those are the projects that I have coming up currently. Um, uh, maybe a few others, but th those are the two big ones that I'm really excited to see to see through. Uh, I think all of us here watching or listening are excited about both of those. <laughs> I mean, how long <laughs> we haven't had a He-Man he since 87? Hasn't been alive that been a long time coming. I have to give a shout out to Constantine Sikiris, um, and then the Knee Brothers, who are the directors. Constantine has worked on multiple iterations of uh, He-Man over the last 10 years or so, like when they've been trying to get it off the ground. Um, and then Anne Foley, very proud of her for costume designing it. And so she, they're currently working on that right now and getting it all together. And I wow. think you guys will be very excited. It looks awesome. Well, Philip Boutte Jr., this has been a rollicking conversation, and I, I could probably sit here and geek out with you for another hour and a half, but I have to let you go. <laughs> I appreciate you having me, and I thank all of you for tuning in. And, uh, yeah, drop me a line. Watch the stuff. I'm, I'm excited. I, I'm very grateful for the career that I have and the, and the, the jobs that I've been able to work on. It's a fun, it's a fun process. Well, thank you so much for being on the Designing Hollywood podcast. What a great time this has been. Thank you so much. A very special thanks to our sponsor, the Western Costume Company, and its empresario, Eddie Marks. The Western Costume Company is a one-stop shop for costume designers, costumers, and stylists. Since the early days of Hollywood over a century ago, Western Costume has been an industry mainstay. Whether you work in film, television, theater, commercials, or fashion, you'll find what you need in their vast warehouse. A special thanks to our producer and founder, Martika Ibarra, and of course, our co-founder, legendary costume designer, Marilyn Vance. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification button, and you can find the Designing Hollywood podcast wherever you get your podcasts, also on iTunes. Follow me, Robert Meyer Burnett, on Instagram, on Twitter at BurnettRM, or find me on my own YouTube channel, The Burnett Work. Thanks for watching. We very much appreciate it.